Well, hello again, everyone. Hope you're doing well. And what do you know? Another sunny day. It's kind of strange because obviously, if you've lived in Morgantown long enough, just out of random occurrence, uh, if you're going to record three audio lectures, it wouldn't be sunny on three days. And I've lived in Morgantown since 1997, so chances are 75% of the days are not sunny. But uh, anyway, we get lucky. Um, hope everyone's doing well, and uh, glad you're taking time to check out the slides and the lecture for the last unit of SCP-425 here in summer 2010. So let's have a look at where we're headed today. Um, one of the things that we're going to get into uh, in this last unit is really focusing on what are the specific things from a sports psychology perspective that you can help injured athletes with during their rehabilitation process. So a lot of these skills and the way this is structured is set up to teach injured athletes during rehabilitation, so after injury, obviously. But there would be nothing that you stopping a sports psychologist or an athletic trainer from teaching some of these skills in a preventative way. So just as an example, say you're an athletic trainer or a physical therapist, obviously you design a physical rehab to repair an injury. Uh, part of that might include then that the athlete would begin doing some range of motion or some flexibility exercises, let's say, to strengthen that area. There's no reason that that athlete couldn't do some of those things in a modified form uh, in the off-season, for example, or in the preseason in a preventative way to prepare them to reduce their risk of injury. And from your readings, you may have already picked some of that up. Some of these things, if you learn how to relax, you learn how to control your self-talk, um, uh, and have positive and realistic thoughts and you're educated about a lot of the uh, stressors that are coming up you may actually prevent stress from occurring or prevent injury from occurring as well so primarily these are uh, set up as a treatment these interventions but they can also be used in a preventative way the most common interventions we've already talked about in previous units will be education about the rehab process uh, we're going to talk a bit about cognitive interventions to expand on the last unit and that will include uh, changing specific self-talk that you hear out of injured athletes, helping them adjust their expert expectations for how rehabilitation is going to go, and then adjusting and goals and, and uh, dealing with changes to goals that occur through injury. And hopefully through that process, uh, they'll, they'll learn how to build confidence and motivation through their things that they control, uh, that they become self-regulated, which ultimately is the big goal of sports psychology anyway. We would like athletes to be self-regulated. Two other skills that can really help athletes in a variety of contexts including injury are relaxation and imagery. And so in this unit you get an opportunity to check out a couple relaxation uh, and imagery scripts that are posted on eCampus and you can listen to those as many times as you want. Uh, you can download them to your iPod uh, your phone, whatever you want to do, and check them out and see what you think about them. So for one of your projects that I'll get into at the end of this unit, you're asked to listen to a couple of those and then uh, provide some reaction. Uh, you will find that if you listen to them the first time, just as a, not as in a way to try to actually go through it, but just to get familiar with it, and then the second time you may be much more comfortable with the process and much more likely to relax or see what you're supposed to see. So let's have a look at some of these uh, interventions. Uh, in many cases, and you know, this is information you can relay back to the injured athlete when they're having trouble coping or they think the injury is the worst thing that's ever happened to them, um, there's a lot of lessons that can be learned through injury that are positives. Because many times, uh, you know, injured athletes are not able to see the good. They consider injury to be a darker time, it's depressing, it's something they didn't want, it's unfair, you know, all of that stuff. But uh, they can definitely learn patience. They learn more about their body. Uh, they learn and understand their specific issues, you know, genetically, biomechanically. Uh, they do get to bond and meet people and meet other injured athletes, meet athletic trainers. And they hopefully get to improve a weakened area. You know, injury a lot of times, unless it's a freak injury, uh, is a sign of some sort of biomechanical weakness. You know, just to give you a personal example, um, I have very uh, loose ligaments and joints just by, just by genetics. I'm called hypermobile. And I had no clue about that, you know, when I had my early sport career. And I was always rolling my ankle and spraining fingers. And, um, and so I was always wondering why am I more injured? Or why am I injured more often? Why am I injury prone? Uh, and then I just figured out that was just 
you know, it's how my genetics are set up. So I, you know, I needed to uh, learn about that. I needed to spend more time strengthening uh, those supporting ligaments. I need to wear the appropriate braces to prevent injury. So those are things that I have learned through the injury process that have been helpful to me in preventing future injuries. I certainly wish they had not recurred, but uh, they caused me to be more resourceful. And there's a great quote from you, Taylor, and Taylor, uh, you know, some text chapters that you've read. Uh, and they, you know, they, there can be growth through injury. And so the attitude is that, you know, this is not the worst thing ever. Maybe you wish it wouldn't have happened, but let's take it for what it is and let's make it uh, a positive experience and things we can learn. And the attitude that athletes take um, can make a huge difference in the experience that they have. Um, and it's our job in sports psychology to hold them accountable to the proper attitudes. Probably our number one thing that we really need to help athletes with is their global attitude, not only related to injury, but in generally how they approach life that they're not doing it in a way that's not useful to them. So athletes who have positive experiences through stress in general, and of course injury specifically, uh, would maybe have some of these attitudes towards their experience. They're motivated now. Not necessarily that they love rehab, they want to be injured, but you know what? They're challenged and they're ready to respond. They're also willing to be flexible in their goal setting because they understand that it's probably not a totally predictable path that, you know, I'm going to increase sets and reps, I'm going to increase minutes, I'm going to get stronger every day, whatever the outcome might be. So they're, they're realistic. They're willing to make a daily a commitment to what is their job in rehabilitation that leads them to have consistent effort. So they're focused on the process, they're less worried about you know the, day, the exact day they're going to get back, they're just trying to have a quality rehab and they're putting in consistent effort. That, that's a useful attitude that they can take. And so, it, But it may take some work to get them to that. It may take a good relationship with the person. It might take them meeting another athlete that has that attitude. But, you know, working with a sports psych professional, uh, you can present them with, here's the, here's the expectations I have of athletes that I work with. You could do that if you're an athletic training student or a certified athletic trainer. You say, here is an attitude of, of athletes that do well in rehab, even with tough injuries. Uh, and so they're not evaluating in this case injury as a happy-go-lucky time, but it's a challenge that they're willing to take and then that leads them to attack it as opposed to being a patient and just uh, wasting their energy. Now, this particular graph is just a, kind of a made-up graph, but it's also a useful thing to share with uh, injured athletes. Uh, because you might want to map to them, here's how I want you to approach rehabilitation when you start out. Let your intensity be lower, and then as you gain strength and confidence, let's build intensity towards the end of rehab. So this will be something like a one-month or a six-week rehab. So by the end of the month, I want you to have your intensity all the way up, you know, to almost what would be 100%. So if you imagine out of 60 here, you know, we're getting up to 85, 90% by the end. But we want you starting out slow, as opposed to overdoing it. If you look at the blue line, that would be kind of an overtraining situation where they push too much early, leads to overtraining, then their, their body can't respond, and, and then there's like a delay, uh, and there might be some non-adherence behavior kind of linked to the last unit. So that can, knowing that and being clear about your expectations, uh, you know, talking here to the athletic training staff, if you can let folks know what is the attitude you expect, what are they accountable for, and then you can help them understand the path of their effort and what rehab's going to look like, then they may from the outset adopt a different approach as opposed to just letting it be uh, predictive of their personality. So taking a little bit more time up front to ensure that the attitude uh, is a result that you like. Here's a specific example of uh, a research study that identified some self-talk in athletes. This was done by a colleague of mine uh, from Japan who now works over there who was very interested in the self-talk of injured athletes and she helped them take their own negative dysfunctional self-talk such as the first statement, and then change it to something that was still realistic, that they could believe in their own words, that was more positive. So this one was an injured athlete that had to use crutches. I believe it was an ACL injury. I hate the blisters on my crutches. I hate these things. I hate not being able to walk, not get around on my own. I hate my knee not bending correctly. Um, change that to something more realistic and functional. Even though I don't like my crutches, I know they're helping my knee heal, 
I also know that in a few weeks I'll probably be able to start walking and bending my knee again. So that, that statement is not, I love crutches. It's something that they can actually believe that simply turns the frustration down enough to get them to actually use the crutches and come show up at rehab. And so that's, that's what I mean by realistic, believable self-talk. That is positive and not I hate this, I hate this, woe is me stuff. Another couple examples. This person was, you know, I'm sitting in the soccer office, this is a soccer player, this is from many years ago, worried I was losing my position because I'm injured. Uh, they changed that self-talk to, I haven't lost my position, I just have to work harder to gain it back. And that's true. So now it's framed up as a challenge. Second is, well, I need to play again, I'm out of shape. Two, okay, I will play again soon. My leg is healing quickly. Okay, so this represents a focus on the negative parts that maybe it is true they feel out of shape to what could be positive and a way to positively interpret that situation. Again, these are the athlete's words. They're asked to take the negative, change it to a positive. And so that's a skill that sports psychologists would be uh, routinely helping injured athletes with uh, throughout the process. Here's another one. I'm really tired today. Rehab's getting harder and harder. Change that to another challenge statement. It's going to make me work harder and get stronger. That's true. It is. And uh, the cool thing about rehabilitation is you do get to see a lot of gains. And in some cases, depending on the injury, athletes may be stronger after the rehabilitation than they would at the beginning, uh, even before they got injured. Here's some other uh, examples of positive self-statements um, from Dr. Nowy's uh, study. Um, and the things that they liked about the self-talk. So they said, I think positively during my rehab because it will help my injury recovery. Okay, it does help. It basically does not help you to think negatively. And as I mentioned in previous units, we want athletes to think, focus on things that are internal, so in other words, that they are responsible for, their job in rehab, and that is within their control. And self-talk and attitude is one of the biggest, in addition to the effort they put in, uh, things that they control in this process and in general in their life. In no time I'll be able to get things back to normal. Okay, so it's, gonna, it's coming. I'm glad that the hardest part of my injury is over, perhaps the surgery. Now I can look forward to getting stronger every day. Uh, I'm looking forward to being on a play again. I'm taking advantage of my time in the training room. So if you're going to be there, take advantage of it and get good quality. So some other examples, which I think was a really cool study. And a lot of the athletes in this study really responded to the self-talk while other athletes really enjoy the relaxation training. So you may find that some athletes you work with are not as keen on the cognitive stuff, the self-talk, uh, whereas others maybe they're really not as comfortable with doing the relaxation of the imagery. So you don't have to use all. You might be able to let them sample it and see which ones they really like. Some of the responses to athletes who use this, these were injured athletes here on WVU's campus, they felt confident, they felt energized, um, they felt themselves getting heat, uh, healthier and strong and then as I mentioned some just really didn't get much of a response at all to the self-talk so it's not magic um, in, the, in my experience working with athletes self-talk is not so good that I could give them an index card for example with some positive words on it that I've written tell them to say it and it works it's not that good uh, it works the best when an athlete develops that language and it's a language that motivates them because it, the words they use or the experiences they're, they use gives them meaning. So uh, I might be able to help them. I might be able to give them some examples as such as the previous ones, but they may not be able to use those exact words because it doesn't resonate. Doesn't you know? They don't feel it in their core. So athletes uh, who like uh, using this stuff uh, typically are the athletes that are into quotes, are really thinkers. Um, definitely very cognitive people and they really like substituting the positive thoughts. For those athletes that are more physical athletes that are not as into the thinking piece then maybe they might prefer relaxation or just uh, uh, imagery instead. Um, in terms of readiness to return and uh, readiness for a psych rehab there's some really cool information in the Taylor textbook that we're going to review that deals with the different types of confidence that we need to help athletes with. Excuse me for a moment. 
Okay, let's proceed. Sorry about that. So, according to Taylor, and this is, uh, like I said, this book is really excellent. It's hard to find this book, and that's why I posted it, um, a lot of the chapters online for this class. But if you do um, search it out on Amazon or half.com, you can find an old copy if you're a sports psycho that's interested in this topic, or if you're an ATC that really wants to get some more specific sports psych information. This book is actually better from a sports psych standpoint, standpoint than your, uh, the textbook that you have for this class. So, initially, when um, an athlete enrolls in rehabilitation, one thing that they need is program confidence, meaning they need to believe in the rehabilitation program uh, that they're being put on. And there's a couple levels to that. They need to have good rapport with that sports medicine professional, trust them, or their surgeon or the doctor, whomever they're working with. They need to, of course, understand the, the exercises, the rest, everything that they're being asked to do. And then perhaps, if they're skeptic, they might need to understand, well, here's the benefit, the rehab efficacy. So the strength, the how much that that rehab program actually works relative to not doing rehab or athletes that really follow it versus those who don't. So if you have any evidence that you can share with them, then that's useful at that time, too, to help them build that. And the task involved climate, I'm going to explain here in a moment just on the next slide. Let's just have a look at that. We'll come back. So a task involved climate is a perception that if they work hard that will be reinforced. Uh, it's a helpful cooperative environment uh, that they can ask questions in. They're encouraged to learn. They can make mistakes. They can have a bad day, come back and not get screamed at. Um, and there's a consistent treatment of all the athletes regardless if they're a starter, non-starter, revenue, non-revenue. Um, in an ego-involved climate, and uh, there's an example of this uh, out there uh, from Bill Parcells kind of training room climate that there's no mistakes you don't even want to go to the training room if you do uh, it's very non-helpful and those athletes uh, there's preferential treatment of those athletes now uh, there's some pros and cons of ego involved climate uh, it basically just means that you want to avoid the training room and uh, really it's not a place for athletes to be so unfortunately it doesn't make the job for the ATC very easy once an athlete is injured or has a serious injury. So ideally early on you want to let the athlete know what you expect of them. This is a critical part of the intervention process and what their job is uh, and then what your job is as the ATC or the sports psych in terms of helping them to create that environment. Okay, let's click it on back now. Now adherence confidence is let's show them that they're having progress. So record it, track it, show it visually, whatever you got to do in some sort of logging form. Talked about self-monitoring before as well. And then showing them that their behavior is linked to why they're getting better. Okay, you iced four times, swelling is reduced by 30%. Nice work. Or hey, looks like you really did your uh, your ankle pumps or whatever, you know, whatever exercise you're having them do. Um, encourage them to use positive self-talk and then catching them if they don't, to help them change that. Um, another useful thing is, is framing up the rehab as their performance now. So a lot of these athletes love to perform, they love to compete, and so one thing you can do is say, listen, this is your performance right now, and I would rate your performance as 5 out of 10, you really need to pick it up, and you need to challenge them and push them um, to put their effort as an athlete into the performance. Moving forward, as they move through rehab, then they need to really get um, confidence physically in their in their body and getting back to the proper running form, throwing form, squatting form, whatever it is that they need to do uh, that gets their conditioning back, their strength back, their feel back. Uh, during this period mental skills such particularly imagery can be great because you know the mind has no limitations so even though your body may not be able to execute for example a tennis serve or a front two and a half dive your mind can do it a thousand times if you want. So you can use those images to create the feeling uh, and to also stimulate the neural pathways while your body can't do it. So that, you know, building physical confidence is coming after and then the last stage, stage obviously is return to sport. Uh, and that's realistic expectations and then using your mental skills as well to prepare adequately for what that's going to be like and uh, am I going to be anxious, how am I going to manage that, and, and other factors that may, that may come up at that time. You know, so it's a useful way to think about certain issues that you might need to focus on in the rehabilitation process to help athletes build that confidence. Now confidence and motivation go, go hand in hand. 
so these strategies, though, are primarily for athletes with longer rehabs, where you're going to see them a lot, you know, a few days a week for several weeks or several months. And uh, they, they just are naturally going to struggle to be motivated. So simple motivational strategy is variety, is uh, you know, giving them choices as well. So mixing it up, different order. Uh, and so they're not seeing the same set, same series of things every time they do it. Um, early on when athletes maybe are not that strong or they're in a lot of pain, uh, make it easy so that they can definitely accomplish it and let them see their progress. So let them monitor it, keep track of it, put it somewhere uh, in the training room, on a wall to show range of motion, uh, in a chart, and then let them take credit for it and talk to them about why they made progress. So help them understand that they're in control of this and they know what they're doing. So that's that control and perceived competence element that when something positive happens, attribute it to the athlete's behavior. Hey, you've been getting in here, you've been working hard, I can tell you're taking your, uh, doing your stuff at home, and you're doing a good job with that. You can also make this a, a fairly visual situation. So let me show you an example of that. So you might uh, take this as uh, the overall 100% range of motion. So starting out from, you know, zero all the way up to 100% range of motion in a particular um, joint uh, or joint area. So you might say, okay, right here is where you are post-injury or post-surgery. And you start to say, okay, after two weeks, you moved it up here. After four weeks, you come in this direction. And then another month, you've gotten almost all the way back. And so by seeing that, even small improvements look like it's building up you know, towards something on the long term. Uh, and you can also build this up for your due goal setting or something like that so that maybe it's fitness related or it's a total number of sets, reps, minutes and rehab and they're working up towards a longer term goal and then you just kind of tick off and, and record uh, short term progress. Okay, so for example, let's say that someone was trying to lose weight in a totally separate uh, goal setting. They might have their starting point weight and down here they might have their ideal weight and they start to mark off every two weeks or every week where they are. So it does two things. One, it keeps them accountable to the long term goals that they've set and it helps keep track progress so that they can visually see and be reinforced for the work that they're doing. You know, long-term and short-term goals, um, if you read the goal setting recommendations in any sports psych book, they'll say use both. Uh, I agree with that. And it's often the long-term goals that hold meaning for athletes as opposed to, you know, today I want to work hard. So there's no problem with keeping track of long-term goals, uh, but you still need to bring them to the present when they're showing up for rehabilitation. So if, they're, if their long-term goal is to get back for a certain competition or by a certain date, um, that's fine. Keep it out there, use it for motivation, and then say, okay, if we're going to do that, then we need to today have a good session or today have a good rest. You need to take a couple days off. <coughs> so instead of focusing on them, uh, I suggest keeping them in mind, but really bringing their, their focus to today, this session, this rep, this exercise. So they can only need to worry about that right now, but then linking that to their external goals. Another strategy we talked about last unit in terms of social support is just find a partner, find a group, keeps people responsible, keeps people engaged, a lot more fun, mixes up the variety, and lets them share the workload. Another option for a training room uh, or for a sports psychologist to do is to develop a rehabilitation contract. Um, and there's a good example of this in the Taylor, chat, Taylor textbook as well. And this basically just spells out on one page, okay, you're in rehab, we're working together. Uh, we being typically the, the athletic trainer and the athlete can also include the sports psychologist. And here are the responsibilities of the athletic trainer. So it basically gives like a job description of what my role is and what I'm committing to you in this rehabilitation. And then it has the athlete's responsibilities to what they're committing to, such as going to maintain a positive attitude, show up on time, be ready to rehabilitate, ask questions when necessary, those type of things. And then both parties sign it, both parties get a copy, and they go home. So it really clarifies from the front end the expectations that we might have been talking about uh, in this unit. Um, in terms of evaluating self-talk, I want to spend a little bit more time uh, on that in the next few slides. And when you're listening to athletes self-talk, 
sometimes negative self-talk can be a good thing. So we don't want to send the message as sports psychology professionals that you should always think positively and happy-go-lucky and all that type of stuff. You should be optimistic in the sense that you should believe most good things are going to happen if you're working hard. See, optimism is a, is a, is a fail-safe, but not unrealistic optimism not narcissism okay so we don't want unnecessary um, positive or unsubstantiated positive now on the same side of that sometimes frustration and negative self-talk that can fire an athlete up that can motivate can work so they might get frustrated with themselves they might get upset but they can use that to fuel their workouts like they get so frustrated that they're they're uh, their injury is sore that they really want to go work out and they really want to go rehab it right now because they're sick of it. They're sick of uh, uh, of being uh, injured. And so as long as they don't overdo it, that can really work. Now, the give up self-talk, when they're really depressed, they're helpless, they're dwelling on and they can't get off of the negative aspects of the injury, many times of which are out of their control, it really just creates avoidance, uh, anxiety, fear. And so we want to get them to change that or we need to ignore it as the professional and, and, and uh, really just model a different language. So if an athlete comes to me with a catastrophic explanation of their two-week ankle injury, uh, at some point I might go, you know, you'll be back in no time. I really don't understand why you're, why you're seeing it as a catastrophe. I, I think you should be able to handle it pretty easily. And so I might really try to challenge the, the way they're interpreting the injury to encourage them to have some sort of more frustration with it as opposed to just depression and negativity. Because you can use frustration, you can use impatience, but once you get to depression and helplessness, there's not a lot of fuel uh, in that particular self-talk. Let's take a couple examples of uh, how our self-talk and how we learn uh, to frame that up. So in the first case, you know, you shouldn't be so upset. This is not a serious injury. And that kind of talks down to the athlete. It has a very negative tone. Instead of, you know what, it's natural to be upset. It's fine. But you've got to turn this energy into motivation. So it's fine to be frustrated, but if you sit in it too long, it's a waste of energy. Another way that has a negative tone. You knew that injury is a part of sport. Or you know that. It's, you know, this just is going to happen. Fact of the matter. Well, hey, you knew there was a chance, but we need to get you focused back on your rehab plans. Okay, that's irrelevant now that it was unlucky or, or whatever. And the tone with which you deliver this information can really have an impact on their attitude. You know, how about, well, I'll never get to the form I had before. So this is an athlete's self-talk. Well, there's every reason you will, as long as you commit to rehab. This is just a setback. So instead of, I'll never, it is, well, it's going to be work. This is a setback, but you know what? I am going to get back. So it's a change from passive, I'll never return, to active and attack. Now, why am I all the one who gets screwed? This is so unlucky. This is always me. Why me, 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 me? You know, hey, injuries are random, hard to explain why it occurred. Let's make the best of it and return stronger. I've seen others do it. I don't know why you can't do it. Okay, very different. On this side of the scale, you've got a passive attitude. Leads an athlete to not really want to put a lot of work into the situation. On this side, you have athletes accepting responsibility, ready to work. Okay, that's what we're looking for, either as the ATC or as a sports psych consultant. So... Is everything attitude? Is it all psychology? No, definitely not. Hopefully you haven't taken that message from this class. It's all about injury history, personality, coping skills, all this stuff. Okay? Psych of injury is complicated. It's an interaction of personal and situational factors. And the, the, each intervention, when you're working with an injury athlete, begins with the individual and your relationship with this person. Okay, I want to stress this point to the sports psych folks um, and also to the ATCs here at the bottom. But All interventions begin with the individual you're working with, that person who has an injury, not the injured athlete. Okay, The person with the injury. And your relationship with that person. So I could be the best sports psychologist, you know, know everything in the textbooks, know every possible technique, but if I, that athlete doesn't resonate with me and doesn't trust me, my knowledge is useless. And I tell every athlete that I work with that, that fact, basically, is that I need them to be successful. Because if I come across as a sports psychologist, as a person who has the answers, that really means then that the athlete doesn't work and that I can fix them. That's not true. They have to fix them. 
themselves, but I'm not going to fix them. Okay, but through, you know, together we can do it uh, pretty effectively. Okay, now transitioning into the last piece here of the intervention will be some different relaxation techniques. And uh, I took some time to upload some, uh, what, are, what are some of my favorite ones on the eCampus site? So I really encourage you to spend some time checking these out and, and listen to them and really try them out. You know, because if you don't like them, that's fine. You know, but it's like I'm like uh, my daughter who's trying to you know eat her fruits and vegetables now. You know, she can tell me that she doesn't like it after she you know she takes a bite of cabbage or a bite of a carrot or whatever else, but she can't tell me she doesn't like it unless she tries it. So it's a basic policy in the Zizzy household: you have to try this stuff. So if you're skeptical about this stuff as an ATC, then for sure you're not going to be very comfortable recommending athletes do it. And it is not that athletes need to do this stuff but it's simply that this is could be an option that you could have available in your training room uh, on the computer on an iPod you can say hey here try this see if you like the breathing exercise see if you like uh, this relaxation see if you like this type of imagery give it a shot while they're icing they got nothing better to do aside from listen to their iPod watch TV or whatever so it's a good opportunity for the athletes to try out some of this stuff now there's different types of relaxation that um, start off with the most basic diaphragmatic breathing typically in through your nose and out through your mouth where you lift the diaphragm and breathe from the belly um, because I've had the pleasure of watching my children sleep all babies are born sleeping from their belly so our natural most relaxed sleep and breathing is from our belly not from our chest when you're tensed when you're panicky you breathe from your chest so basically what you do is you teach people to breathe. Sorry about that brief interruption. I guess it was very brief for you guys. Um, the other techniques that are uh, more, most commonly taught are passive relaxation, where you have folks uh, start to release tension out of their body and focus on different parts of their body without doing any of the progressive element. The progressive relaxation is tensing and relaxing um, each piece of your body and doing it in a very structured uh, way. I did not provide an example of this uh, technique, but there are some elements in the uh, the healing imagery exercise on eCampus that will let you, uh, you know, practice some of this stuff. So the progressive relaxation, if you uh, want to follow along just for a minute, you might imagine this as, um, let's use your uh, your right arm, for example. So hold your right arm out in front of you just for a moment. and. Uh, and just clench your fist so that you've got maybe about 50% tension in your arm. And just hold it there and and feel the the tension in your muscles, in your hand, in your forearm, and your and your bicep, maybe a little bit in your shoulder. Just hold it there for a second. So one of the elements of progressive relaxation is to just be aware of tension. Then I want you to uh, increase that tension to about 100%. Really make it tense. So you've got all your muscles firing there. And hold that there for a second. Just notice how tense it is. Then take a big deep breath in through your nose real slowly. Maybe count to four. And when you're ready to release that breath, go ahead and let it all out. And then let go of your arm and let all the tension out of that. So when you do that process, you may notice that your arm is, you know, more relaxed now, and certainly than it was before when you're tensing it. And progressive relaxation simply has you repeat that process several times for each body part, and you start to become aware of tension. You start to learn how to relax, and of course, you're learning a breathing method throughout that. So there's nothing really psychological about any of these techniques. They're quite behavioral in the sense they just have you go through some simple behaviors. Uh, in order to learn how to relax your body, which for many athletes and injured athletes it would be very useful. Now one caveat would be progressive relaxation would not be appropriate for certain areas of injury. So if you have, let's say, a dislocated elbow, for example, you would never have an athlete go through progressive relaxation that would involve their elbow because it would cause significant pain in certain parts of rehab. So in some points, passive relaxation would be much more appropriate during rehabilitation. Um, some of the benefits of relaxation training include bringing more blood flow into the injured area to clean it up. 
you'd have less muscle tension and guarding. Uh, you would have improved pain management. That uh, would give you something to focus on. And it also really helps you just feel like you're in control of some of the tension and pain that you're uh, experiencing. You know, these benefits are presumed to help improve the rate of healing. Okay, so if you've got more blood flow to the area, you're able to manage pain better, you felt in control, just that alone, those effects are likely to improve healing because they're going to lead to you feeling better, doing more rehab perhaps, getting stronger. Aside from the psychoneuroimmunological effects that we've talked about uh, before, such as when you are more relaxed, when you are controlling your stress better, you're going to reduce uh, the incidence of cortisol in your system, which is not going to damage your, your system. You're going to have a little more uh, positive physiological response to stress. Some additional benefits is they, uh, you now have some sort of a tool in your toolbox that you can control and settle your heart rate down, which for athletes going into competition or pressure, pressure situations can be really, really helpful. Um, you do learn more effectively when you're relaxed. So when you, it's oftentimes you do relaxation before imagery. It's also something to do before, um, you know, if you're stressed out and you're trying to study for an exam or something like that is to uh, spend a few minutes, just five minutes breathing or going for a walk and coming back. Uh, relaxation also helps with focus and attention because it asks you to be mindful of one thing at one time. You know, students are always asking me about this stuff, like, well, how can we help athletes focus and how can we get more focused? How you do that is you do one thing at one time, do it well, and then repeat that. If that's how you do it, you single task, you don't multitask. Okay, I know it sounds contradictory to basically everything else you learn about, oh, how valuable multitasking is. I don't believe that. Okay, I believe, yes, you can bounce back and forth between tasks, but if you're trying to do two things at once, there's no doubt in my mind you're less effective. That's why when you're driving and you're trying to use your cell phone, you're getting into more accidents because you're disrupting your awareness of driving to deal with being on your phone or texting. Okay, you're, you're ultimately not as good at either one. Okay, or if you ever try to watch TV and talk on the phone, you might be doing both. Yes, you're multitasking, but you're not doing either one well. So my suggestion is that this helps athletes get a rare moment to do one thing, focus their attention singularly, which then helps them translate that over into an athletic environment. Single tasking, don't doubt it. Now, a couple of reasons why imagery may work, transition into imagery. Uh, you may remember these theories from your 272 class, you may not. Um, there is evidence, uh, physiological evidence, that when we imagine, uh, for example, this was from skiing research by a guy named Robert Swin back in the 70s and 80s, when downhill skiers simply go through imagery, in other words, they're not doing anything physically, all they're doing is seeing themselves going down the course, they will have neural stimulation in the appropriate parts of their legs, calves, knees, all that stuff, uh, even when they're not doing anything physical. So the images do lead to neuromuscular activation at a low level. So if you're injured, you can't do the activity, but you do your imagery, you may get some of those um, neural pathways rebuilt uh, through by using your imagery. Symbolic learning theory is another way, another theory that help, basically helps you go over the pattern, the map for these skills. So maybe imagine something like uh, a dive or uh, a tennis stroke or a golf swing that you have this encoded idea of what that looks like, feels like. And so a lot of athletes will do imagery right before they do the task. So a golfer might see exactly where the ball is going to go, for example, before they hit it. A diver might rehearse that dive in their mind before they do it. So by doing this while you're injured, it just simply keeps the map fresh and allows you then to execute it when you're coming back to return to sport because obviously you cannot do that when you're experiencing an injury. Um, some things that will affect whether the imagery is any good. Um, you try to make it full sensory experience. Don't control whether it's internal or external at all. Um, and the athlete does need to be skilled in, in, in imagery in the sense that they do need to have vivid images. So you do have to kind of go back to your 272 information and help athletes understand whether they're any good at imagery, um, evaluate their imagery skill, and then if you have to improve, help them improve their imagery skill.
you know, in my experience working with athletes, some people are very passionate about their imagery, and most people use it very informally in few moment segments, almost in a daydreaming capacity, but very few want to do it in a formal way. Now, injured athletes have the luxury of time. They may not see it as a luxury of time, but they spend a lot of time sitting around. So there is an opportunity for them to pop it in their iPod and listen to it for 20 minutes while they elevate their leg or why they ice or why they do stem. So there's plenty of opportunity for them to practice it compared to regular student athletes that don't have those quote natural timeouts. Um, it, it just fits a little bit better with injured athletes because then they also ultimately have a purpose for why they're using it. Um, the key elements I already mentioned here, vividness, controllability, um, and you know research has shown that maybe one in four, one in five let's say 20% of clients will be open to and interested in imagery. So it's not an intervention, in my opinion, that is, has a broad appeal as would uh, relaxation training, which maybe eight out of 10 athletes I've ever taught really like it. Simple, there's nothing kind of psycho mumbo jumbo about it, not much of a stigma, whereas imagery takes a little bit more of a creative, imaginative type of person to really get into it, and they need to see those things clearly. so. That more things have to be in place for it to be effective. The most common forms of imagery um, are healing and performance imagery. Healing imagery is literally seeing your injured area getting better. Uh, the effectiveness of this type of imagery is, the, the first predictor is what I just mentioned, is that they're open to the general idea of doing it. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily have to be biologically correct, it doesn't have to um, you know, a tendon doesn't have to exactly look right, for example, um, but the images should have power and meaning. So you could even have an athlete that felt like the light of God was going to heal them, and they image that light coming over their injured area, and that could be effective for them, could be meaningful. Because a lot of client, a lot of athletes uh, uh, may have that faith, and that's maybe the image they prefer versus a very mechanistic view of the tendon repairing and the um, what is it going to look like outside, what color is it, you know, a very anatomical view. Whereas if you had someone who's maybe a medical student or a, an ATC, an athletic training student who was injured, maybe they really want to see it from that perspective and that's the meaning and the power of it. Whereas others may have very vague images. Either way, whatever images are meaningful and powerful, that's the direction you should go when working with the athlete. Uh, another type of imagery that a lot of athletes like, probably appeals the most when I've done this with teams or individual athletes, is soothing imagery. This totally dissociative technique, like go to the beach, go to the forest, and I usually don't pick where they go. I just tell them to go to a comfortable place where they feel confident, they feel safe, and they just go away from wherever they are. It's, like, it's the same kind of technique as you might use to watch your favorite TV program, watch your favorite movie, play your favorite video game because it it disconnects your brain from reality for a few moments and allows you to recharge. So soothing imagery basically takes you on a guided journey to someplace beautiful, warm, comfortable, you spend a few moments there, you feel that place and then you return back to reality. So you get 15 minutes of recovery there of not being in pain or being in less pain or being warm when you were cold. You know, so that soothing imagery, if you repeat that on a daily basis, you're able to improve your mood state, help you cope with pain. A lot of athletes really just like the break that this provides uh, and, you know, playing around with being somewhere at the beach or somewhere else. As you get closer to return to rehab, uh, I'm sorry, return to play, performance imagery kind of takes more of a focus. So you can maintain some skills, like I mentioned, due to the, the two theories there, psychoneuromuscular theory and symbolic learning theory. Uh, and it will also help you maintain continuity of training, like you might feel like, okay, I haven't been out as, out as long as I, as I really have physically, because you're, you're mentally very sharp. Um, you do learn a method to regulate your stress uh, through doing, because typically every imagery exercise will include some breathing and some relaxation. And then hopefully you're more in the moment and you're confident when you're getting ready to get back in there. Okay, It can be used more specifically in rehabilitation uh, in the sense that you can prepare for progression a new exercise. They might rehearse it before they do it, particularly if it's something where the, the ATC wants them to do something very specifically. 
Um, uh, and although it takes a very highly motivated athlete to engage in that in that particular activity. Okay. So benefits that we haven't discussed is that uh, this is kind of a classic uh, sports psych term is covert conditioning, meaning hidden, covert. It's not actually happening versus overt, which is physically what you're doing. So when you get some mental practice, and going back to the example of uh, maybe a diver who really can't dive due to an injury, uh, maybe they uh, had a concussion or they had some other injury, they can do as much imagery as they want. So you know, your physical re rehab uh, is restricted. You can only do so many sets and reps. Uh, you may not be able to compete at all, but you can imagine yourself competing in a covert way. And so it keeps you at least somewhat sharp. And you, those repetitions, even if they count for 10% of the real thing, because I would never argue that imagining it is better than actually doing it, uh, even if they are 10% of that, why wouldn't you recommend that to an athlete if they were so motivated to do it? Okay, so it has the benefit of not being restricted physically. All right, some tips if you're going to get athletes to, uh, you're going to recommend that athletes uh, rehab and, and use relaxation imagery in that process. Uh, most of the benefits are shown if there's regular practice. And regular practice means a few times a week for a few minutes each time. So we're not talking about hours. Um, if you can find moments to pair up relaxation imagery into rehab, so every time they do stem, for example, they'd pop in soothing imagery. Or every time they do icing, they would go and do you know deep breathing or whatever it might be. And I would just encourage you, if you're an ATC, to just let them try it. Say, here, try it and see what you like and give me some feedback. It's not something that you want to shove at them. Not everyone will love it. But a lot of athletes really do respond to the relaxation and the breathing, and they like it because it's something they can actually do and it teaches them to breathe, it takes them to a different place and in my experience it really helps people to just be in the present moment and not worry about other stuff for just a few moments which then they come back out of that and it was a qualitatively different experience for them uh, particularly for college student athletes that are um, I think just generally stressed and have a lot of demands on their time um, if you're having issues with controllability then you can have them play around almost looks like a rewind and edit feature in their mind. So if they're replaying the injury, for example, or they're seeing themselves return to sport and get re-injured, then go ahead and have them, okay, rewind that and go back and see it in a different way. Um, you don't want them having negative images all the time because we're trying to, you know, according to psychoneuromuscular theory and symbolic learning theory, those patterns are going to become learned pattern. So if you're having a lot of negative images, you don't want them to repeat that. You will need to teach them to do it in a different way. A couple other tips. You know, different types of imagery, as I mentioned, if they're having a lot of pain, they might just want soothing imagery early on. Uh, if they're having trouble with their images, get them some videotapes. Almost every coach, every sport now, you're getting videotape of that stuff. So they can use that and then automatically close their eyes and try to see it. So they see it on the video, they try to see it in their mind. They repeat that until they get clarity. Um, let them choose what they like. And, uh, you know, I think the try it and see attitude is the key. Is they get to sample it out. Um, and then they might decide, you know, that's cool. Let me, see, let, me, let me see some more of that. But in my experience, relaxation is preferred over imagery. Uh, but those athletes that really prefer the imagery do uh, tend to use it quite a bit. Do tend to use it quite a bit. So hopefully a lot of the intervention uh, uh, content makes a little more sense now. You understand how to implement the cognitive interventions, at least have an early introduction understanding of that. Work on confidence with athletes and motivation, and then also deal with relaxation and imagery. And I hope that you're able to get some experience with that and really take the time. I think each one of them is 10 to 15 minutes, so it might take you an hour to listen to them, you know, three times in a row. I would not do it back to back to back. I would pick three separate times for your discussion thread six, where you do the relaxation exercise and pick three separate days when you do the imagery just so you can uh, have a different experience of it. And try to do them, try to do the relaxation when you're a little bit stressed or at a time when you're having tension or after a workout or something like that and then do the imagery when you're more clear of mind, if you can. Okay, now I want to spend just a couple minutes on the final project here so you understand what I'm looking here. You need to pick um, one of the, uh, med oh, whoops, excuse me, one of the topics 
for your handout based on the mental skills in this particular unit. Then you're going to develop a one-page handout for an injured athlete on that topic. Okay, so you might pick, for example, relaxation training for a diver or something of that nature. It's very important that you use your own words to develop this handout and you do not plagiarize from other sources, including your textbook, which is a problem I've had with students doing this type of assignment in the past. So the, the handout should be written in the terms that an athlete can understand. So you may have to translate something from your textbook or from some article you find. Do not go online, find a goal setting handout, and then copy and paste the bullets into your handout. It's obviously very easy for me to figure that stuff out. I've been doing this assignment for a long time. If you have some concerns about this and you're not sure how to deal with it, then you need to let me know. You can use sources and you can cite sources if you want, but if you're going to cite a source, let's say online you find something from mindtools.com, which is a common website for a bunch of sports site stuff, and they had some tips for relaxation training. Those should not be your tips. You need to reword those. You need to find a different way to structure them. You need to you can use the content, you just simply can't copy and paste that content. So you should adapt the stuff you've been reading from the slides here, from the readings, and then uh, create a handout that would teach the athlete, you know, basically about uh, what this is, what's it going to do for you, and then how to use it within their, uh, you know, their injury. Okay, so please, of course, drop me an email, um, and you need to get all of these uh, Unit 4 assignments finished up by the end of class. Okay, and the end of our class is uh, finishes up on August 6th, and all your assignments are due right before that. I believe one day before that, on the 5th. Uh, but I do encourage you to check uh, on eCampus for the official ones. I don't have it listed here on this slide, but all the official due dates are listed on uh, eCampus. So I hope you enjoyed the class. Uh, I do encourage you to give me any feedback on email about that, uh, and I'll probably post up some electronic evaluations of the course as well. But I hope you enjoyed your summer, and uh, feel free to come by and uh, introduce yourself in the fall if you're back on campus and uh, you want to say hello. Enjoy the rest of your summer.